Hello again. When talking about additive manufacturing, one very quickly speaks about sustainability because there's no similar manufacturing process when it comes to saving resources, recycling, and avoiding overproduction. Especially now that we're being shown how fragile our global system is and how extensively we are using our resources, the question of sustainable technologies is more important than ever. I well remember a speech by Lynn Kaiser in which he compared 3D printing with the growth in nature. Just as in nature, where growth is created by cell division, meaning the addition of cellular material, 3D printing creates the finished product by building up the material rather than removing it. A comparison that still fascinates me personally today, but certainly not the only one that describes the topic of sustainability in additive manufacturing. In our panel on sustainability today, we would like to highlight the aspects of additive manufacturing in their topic, look at current examples and critically examine the current state of awareness of sustainability in additive manufacturing. And I welcome to our panel, fully digital, Felix Ewald, CEO at Dimension, Dr. Christian Arz, Head of Department Technology Integration at the Fraunhofer Institute of for Production Technology, Stephen Fitzpatrick, Additive Manufacturing and Machining Group Lead at National Manufacturing Institute, Scotland, University of Strathclyde, and Christoph Ionta, Founder and Executive Vice President at Moleyworks. Hello together and thank you for taking the time. Hello everybody, how are you? Everybody fine? Good, thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. Yeah, great, thanks. Good to have you and that panel. Christian, um, start with you. Um, sustainability um, and additive manufacturing. Can we say in general that AM is more sustainable than traditional manufacturing methods? Is, and is sustainable a topic you deal with in your field? So I think what we can say in principle and what's definitely true is that AM is more material efficient um, in uh, terms of sustainability. So we are using only the material that we need to produce the product and we can easily and in many cases digitally adapt the number of pieces that we have to do to the real need of the market and things like these. So that makes AM technologies um, sustainable, but for sure we have always to consider the whole process chain. So um, for example, considering powder manufacturing, it can be that in the whole view, uh, including energy consumption during the preparation of the materials and so on, things might be a little bit different. And so it's extremely important to recognize this as a topic and to see what we can realize about um, the sustainability with additive manufacturing. But basically, those uh, manufacturing technologies maybe have the best starting point to being really sustainable. What I feel, what we feel in our daily work is that maybe the recognition of their capability to being more sustainability uh, of those technologies is not yet fully understood in the industry. And um, the, necess the necessity to realize more sustainable manufacturing and to use, for example, additive manufacturing for this is something which will become even more important in the coming years. So I think this is a really um, important uh, topic not to be underestimated. Okay, thank you so much. Felix, um, with Dimension for Power, Power Fuse S and the technology used, you have won the call for the Green Deal Award. Uh, please give us an insight. What is exactly behind that and what is your opinion about sustainability in additive manufacturing? Thanks, Ben. I, I hope it's okay if I introduce myself uh, Go ahead. quickly. Um, uh, so I'm Felix, um, co-founder and CEO of Dimension, and uh, we are a Munich-based company and we are providing equipment for industrial post-processing of 3D printed um, plastics. We are doing this since more than five years now, and we are a team of 80 people and we have over 500 machines in field right now. And yes, um, we have been selected by the EU for the Green Deal Award with the market start of our PowerFuse S. So to give you some details on that, um, the EU sees 3D printing as a technology with huge potential to reach climate neutrality. 
And the Power Fuse S fits perfectly into this picture because it's the first solution with the truly clean solvent for vapor polishing. And it also fits perfectly to the goals of a circular economy and a toxic free production environment. So to sum it up, we have been selected because we accelerate the development of 3D printing with the Power Fuse and the machine itself fulfills all criteria for a sustainable manufacturing method. And my personal statement to sustainability and 3D printing is quite clear. And so we all who are working in 3D printing, we, we all are working on the manufacturing technology um, of the future. And the big topic of the future is sustainability, at least in my opinion, and I hope that all of you agree on that. And um, with 3D printing, we can send products via email and produce them on site, which is a thousand times cooler and way better and then sending them around the world via ships, trucks and aircrafts. So I think and we all in this industry have a huge potential impact on reducing global GHG emissions. And I think we all should take responsibility and develop sustainable technologies for 3D printing. Great. Uh, let me add one question, Fix, because you just mentioned the solvent you have used uh, in your technology. When you, when you developed the solvent, was the driver sustainability or what was the initial thought when going that way? Yeah, actually, I mean, vapor polishing, there are some approaches already on the market for um, some years, but for us, it was clear when, when we started with the development. Um, I mean, we talked to our big customers, the big OEMs, and we, we asked them, hey, what what do we need to do that you are um, willing and able to um, use such a technology um, in your production environment? And basically, um, yeah, but basically it was very customer driven. So when we came up with our solvent, we had um, discussions with them and they uh, told us if, um, this is a if it's possible to use this solvent in their production environment. So basically it was more a customer driven decision than, um, yeah, then, I mean, sustainability, of course, was super important, but actually we, we started the development after we dis had a discussion with our customers. Great, thank you. Steven, NMIS is one of the 12 leading organizations have, that have joined the Additive Manufacturer Green Trade Association, which was established to promote the environmental benefits of additive manufacturing. What are you exactly doing in your organization? What is your daily work? And uh, what are you doing to bring more clarity and attention to the issue of sustainability? Thank you. Um, so at the National Manufacturing Institute Scotland, we are committed to sustainability. Um, the National Manufacturing Institute Scotland, it's a place where industry, academia and the public sector work together um, on groundbreaking manufacturing research. Um, we are part of, we are part funded by the Scottish Government and the UK Government. Um, and we also make up one of the seven centres of the high value manufacturing catapult. And as part of the UK's economic recovery, um, you know, sustainability is central to that. So, you know, for a number of years, the AFRC has been, or the National Manufacturing Institute Scotland has a specialist centre called the AFRC. And that's been working on, you know, sustainable processes for a number of years, particularly around forging and forming technologies where material utilisation can be, can be of benefit. But in terms of you know, additive manufacturing, um, we started working on remanufacturing of components using laser metal deposition around seven years ago. Um, and LMD, or laser metal deposition, offers some benefits which traditional art-based uh, processes um, cannot and, and allows and enables a remanufacturing process. Um, so we have looked at you know, a number of different things in this area, but particularly around high-value tooling um, and we've seen, you know, up to 120% improvement in a particular Innovate UK funded project called Digital. Um, and that has allowed us to work in a number of different sectors across, um, you know, the energy and renewable sector. So, you know, I think our focus has been on the economic benefits of that. Um, and I think, as Christian mentioned, you know, there's challenges around fully understanding, you know, the carbon emissions benefits from that as well. So, you know, we want to, you know, Put more interest, put more research and development into understanding the life cycle analysis of additive and be able to quantify this. Um, so in MIS, we know there's a lot of potential 
um, sustainability benefits in AM, but we also know that there's a lot of challenges. Um, so we want to be stepping in front of this and really understanding everything around sustainability for additive manufacturing. And as you mentioned there, you know, one of the ways that we're doing this is through the AMGTA or joining the Additive mm -hmm. Manufacturing Team Trade Association. Um, and this is a global trade association that's set up to promote um, sustainability benefits around additive manufacturing. And, and we've joined this for, for a number of reasons. Um, I've spoken about remanufacture, but we're also developing processes around a number of other different additive manufacturing processes. So we want to understand you know, how sustainable these processes are from you know, cradle to grave or from cradle to cradle, for instance. Um, we want to tap into and contribute to the research and development in this area. As I mentioned, life cycle analysis, I think, is critical to this. Um, and we also want to learn from other global organisations. You know, I think that's probably the key to this, uh, being able to collaborate with different organisations around the world to promote the sustainable benefits of additive manufacturing. So um, working in an association um, must has a, has a basis of common understanding. Do you feel there is a common understanding in the manufacturing industry for sustainability already? I think that we're getting there. You know, I think there needs to be a lot more um, to be done in that area. You know, companies are struggling to survive just now, really. Um, Start struggling to, to with cash flow and to make ends meet. Um, so obviously economic drivers are, are going to be you know forefront in most businesses' uh, minds just now. Um, so I feel that the industry does understand that. Um, but I do feel there probably needs to be both uh, a top-down and a bottom-up approach to this, where you know there can be support. Um, and funding, for instance, and other mechanisms to really um, get industry buy-in and getting them to drive the sustainable benefits of manufacturing in general, but particularly around additive manufacturing. Great. Christopher, may I say this much? Mollyworks had also won an award, um, the AM Ventures Impact Award, which was presented for the first time this year. What is behind the award and why did Mollyworks win this year, Christopher? And what are you doing? Yeah. First, uh, thank you to AM Ventures and Formnex for the opportunity to, to basically use this platform to highlight the importance of sustainability as a strategy. Uh, the Greyhound has been uh, recycling metal since uh, 2016, first with lunch pails, then old engine blocks, and then downhole drill collars. Uh, since we started printing, we also started recycling support structures, used metal powder, and all of that really came from necessity. Uh, the Greyhound was built in a shipping container for the, you know, the, the reason that, that we're a small company, we were a startup and had no money. Um, but building in the shipping container unlocked the, uh, the mindset and the capability of the Greyhound could go to the point of need, could go to the scrapyard, could go to the manufacturing site and start recycling uh, the metal that was available and get it to added manufacturing grade powder. But also here the question, Christopher, I mean, you, you heard the, the arguments, first come the economic reasons, then we come to the sustainability aspect. Um, what was the driver when, when starting Moli Works, uh, stepping into ground and, and uh, working towards such an award, for example? Yeah, I mean, the first uh, main driver was to, to show a more economical way to, uh, to create metal powder um, instead of being reliant on, on metal wire or an ingot, uh, we could go directly um, from a metal source that was neither of those, uh, in particular scrap. And uh, the unfortunate thing about sustainability is that everyone will take credit for it, but very few will, will pay more for it. Um, so we had to offer uh, a service uh, which checks multiple boxes, uh, basically their metal waste stream, uh, their metal powder, and then their transportation uh, mode um, and then to provide uh, an economic solution or a cost competitive uh, alternative and that's the strategy that we took. So there's still the question who can't afford sustainability it's that's what I what I take with me from the first minutes. Christian uh, what more do you need to or do we need to do to experience more such examples like from Felix and Christopher with their solutions what what is Fraunhofer working on in this topic? So 
I think what, what comes out of those examples is that, um, yes, there is this view that sustainability is something that uh, you, you, you have to be able to afford. But if you look at the complete product life cycle, if you look at the complete thing, then in many cases, this is not true. Because only looking um, at, the, at, at the small part of producing a, a part where the design has already been fixed many years ago, then in many cases, you will be uh, going into higher costs by investing maybe in new technologies like AM. But if you look at the whole product, if you start with the function of the product, if you think about redesigning the products in order to make them, um, let's say, optimized for those technologies, um, then in many cases you will be more sustainable on the one hand and you will definitely also um, have some cost advantage by doing it uh, in a, um, a new way. And this is how you can combine sustainability on the one hand and cost savings on the other. And I think there are many examples already, but with the structures that we have in the, in the industry typically today, we do not really see those advantages. So we have to come into more transparency of what sustainability is, of what the costs of the um, production and of the parts really are, and this is something we can only uh, come to if we uh, have kind of a real yeah, life, life cycle assessment of the product and if we start um, understanding what is the, the total cost of ownership, if you want so, um, of those parts and uh, of making those parts. And this is why we have to enlarge the scope from only looking at the manufacturing part to looking at the whole product life cycle of the part. So I think this is, and, and there are many projects going on, not only at Fraunhofer, also at many other areas, in order to making this more visible and to trying to convince the industry um, to have this more global view and global understanding of why uh, those activities are so important. Uh, it's, um, it's a hard job, I would say. It's, it's, a, it's a certain way to go, to come there, to, to convincing also um, uh, when you have traditional structures in the, in the companies. But we see more and more cases where this is uh, more and more understood and this goes into um, also the strategic uh, decision-making within the companies. Great. Yeah. Um, so I only can agree um, um, on that. So it's hard to work on that, but we definitely should. But in the end, it's always the customer who decides, right? Um, if customers, if they don't care, then you cannot do anything. Yeah? You can try to do a better job in explaining it, but in the end, customer decides. And uh, we are an industry where a lot of companies start with 3D printing, and it's a huge investment to, to start with 3D printing. And um, we really, yeah, should work on how we can also convince um, customers who start with 3D printing to already look um, on this topic from the very beginning. I think this is the job that we have to do. But as I just mentioned, in the end, it's always the customer um, um, who decides. Uh, that brings an interesting uh, question. Stephen, from a research point of view, um, how much can you influence the perspective of the end client? It means, I mean, there are various additional benefits of additive manufacturing considering sustainability. Which are they? Do you, can you mention more and how we can transfer that to those people who decide finally? And that's where I think of end customers, not the customers, Stephen. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's, it's quite variable. You know, if we look at, for instance, the energy sector, who we work with quite closely, um, you know, we've got a, a large oil and gas sector in Scotland. You know, they, they have really grasped the nettle, if you like, on sustainability and, you know, they've got a net zero agenda now. So, you know, as an operator like BP or Shell or Baker Hughes or, or any of these companies, the, the sustainability strategy is, is forefront in their minds. So now we've got the opportunity to say, right, well, we have these other manufacturing processes and technologies which we could support your net zero agenda with, for instance, now. And that door is, is more open than mm -hmm. what it's ever been. Um, however, you know, there is other sectors um, and other companies that, that maybe aren't as at, at the forefront or sustainability isn't at the forefront of their minds. And that is a challenge. It, it certainly is. 
Um, and all what we are doing is we are developing manufacturing processes um, and showing you know, the benefits, both from an economical perspective and now from a sustainable perspective, you know, the benefits of that. Um, and we are carrying that out through our own research and development activities. Okay. Um, but I agree, it, it is a challenging area, um, particularly to work across different supply chains and sectors. Great. Christopher, I mean, you have a f fully closed cycle with your production at Molly Works, uh, as far as I understood it. Um, how does a full costing change when um, you factor in the sustainability effects in AM? Is it changing in the something in the full cost uh, approach? Yeah, the fastest way to accelerate the adoption of additive manufacturing is through cost. So we fundamentally believe that. And going uh, directly from scrap metal uh, into powder allows you to bypass that ingot step. So if you can provide metal powder at the cost of ingot, you can open the door for many, many more uh, applications at the same time squeezing your competition. Um, so that's, I mean, that's uh, essentially a strategy of the company. Um, and that, uh, that also uh, incorporates the sustainability angle of it by utilizing the manufacturing waste of traditional uh, machining or traditional methods. Mm. Great. But, uh, so, sorry to ask, Sven, I, 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 because I really have to get this. So basically, what, what are you doing? You take waste, metal waste, and then you produce powder out of it. Is that yeah, right? That's, yeah, that's correct. So support <laughs> structures, metal powder, Uh, old parts, uh, droppings from forgings, uh, failed builds, uh, basically any any uh, turnings, swarf, chips, um, any combination of, of scrap metal is, is the feedstock and that's used uh, in, in a melting process and then is directly atomized uh, into metal powder. Right. Super cool. It that's is super cool. Super cool. And we will hear... And of course, you're right, yeah, with the um, argument that if... If you go if you go in with lower costs, then you are. I mean, that's the the easiest argument, right? Um, I mean, we have a, a different situation once again to our power fuse S. Yeah, because, I mean, our machine is uh, slightly more expensive than um, potentially other systems on the market because we use this solvent. We need kind of more a more technical machine, um, and on the long run, um, uh, we are cheaper. So if you really go into high volumes, we we can prove uh, that. Um, We have lower costs per lower cost per part, but just that the machine is 50k more expensive um, is it's a, it's a huge hurdle, right? Um, if people start with the technology, but uh, of course a solution um, like uh, Chris just mentioned is uh, super cool. Uh, if, the, if it's uh, clear from the very beginning that you have lower costs and you can, and then also the sustainability topic comes in. So I, I think it's uh, super valuable what you're doing and super interesting. And uh, and uh, Chris just told me that it's uh, 4 p 4 a.m. in the morning for him. So I think it's also super cool uh, that you woke up so early to tell us this. <laughs> that's that's not too bad, honestly. Thank you for that one, uh, Felix. Uh, sorry, another question for you. Um, you mentioned that finally your customer decides a little bit. Can you give us an insight of uh, which uh, industries or uh, yeah yeah which kind of companies are actually buying your solution right now? What is the focus? Yeah, I think the great thing with 3D printing is that um, we are um, industry agnostic, right? Um, so 3D printing is uh, important for almost all manufacturing industries out there. So this really helps, especially now also during um, COVID-19, right? Um, so we are not, um, yeah, we, we don't have only one uh, customer uh, segment. And so it's quite different from, yeah, as I mentioned, completely different segments. Um, and of course, the questions um, are different and the needs of the customers. But what we definitely see already is that um, the big OEMs, the big companies, they are really looking into those uh, sustainable, um, sustainable topics. And um, also the smaller companies, at least if you mention the topic, um, and they are, yeah, they are interested. But I think um, um, uh, yeah, sustainability can and will be pushed, especially um, by big, big companies out there, even though that small companies, of course, can also uh, play um, a leading role. But I think, um, 
yeah, the, the, the big companies will be one of the big um, drivers in terms of sustainability in the next years because they really ask for that and they are looking into that. Great. Um, before we come, we have a question from the audience, but before we come to that, I would like to ask Christian. Uh, Christian, I mean, uh, y your company or your institute is very well known and addressed by the industry if it comes to technical topics and uh, the re research on it and solutions. Um, what kind of, com are there companies addressing you regarding the topic sustainability and uh, do they ask you Uh, whether you have, uh, uh, yeah, you can consult them in this topic? Is that something where, where companies approach you? Yes. So we see that this is a topic, uh, a topic which, which becomes more and more important to the industry. Um, for sure, in the moment, I think it's mostly starting with the larger companies because uh, sometimes it's also a question of... Um, Uh, let's say having uh, this as their as their as their guideline as their strategy for the future to become more sustainable and to use this also as an argument uh, for their product and things like these. Um, and what we see is that mostly the point is that there is this missing transparency. So there there are just no key figures in the moment um, in order to really um, yeah kind of putting a sign to certain manufacturing technologies, to certain products, to certain aspects of this. And when, when it comes to sustainability, then everything is about the balancing, right? So, so where do you start and where do you stop when uh, regarding a certain product or a certain manufacturing uh, process? So this is becoming a, a really important topic. This is our feeling and not only from the political side when, where there is more and more Uh, let's say, um, regulation and, 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 and pressure on this topic, but this is also becoming something where companies say that they have to be more sustainable in order to being, um, let's say, uh, future-proof in a certain way um, uh, regarding those topics. Um, and, and, and we have many projects going on in this field, and it's in most cases uh, about finding out uh, what, what are really the, the key figures to be looked at more in detail. Great. So there's a technical question from the audience. Christopher, I think this goes to you. Uh, there's a question. Um, what technical scientific developments are being made to recover material properties on the recycling process that are lost after use? So how do you recover the, the material properties during the recycling process? So uh, the Greyhound uses a refining technique. Uh, so we refine the metal to remove uh, impurities Most impurities would be high density inclusions or low density evolved organics. Um, solution is uh, really, the only solution is really dilution. Uh, and another way to say it is uh, putting higher quality scrap, so solid scrap with lower quality scrap, which would be the metal powder. Uh, but the future roadmap is going to be more in like a reactive plasma or a reducing plasma where you're actually refining out uh, more and more of the, the contamination. So, um, Yeah, those, those, that's the here and now, and, and the future is going to be using uh, more of a uh, refining plasma. Great. Stephen, um, one question to you. I mean, we, we, hear, we see here two startups, or sorry, Dimension, I would not longer consider you as a startup. Felix, I hope you agree. Oh, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to stress you too much on that. But um, Stephen, I mean, you, you see here companies uh, that... that uh, had been innovative, um, they, they brought up solutions. What is happening on the research side? I mean, of course, you're optimizing processes, you're developing uh, manufacturing processes regarding additive or, or other manufacturing processes, but where is the, uh, are there specific projects just focusing on sustainability and how to optimize that, or is it always a mixture? So, you know, I think I had mentioned at the start, you know, the drivers around our research and development projects have predominantly been economic drivers, productivity drivers. You know, that's natural. Um, however, you know, NMIS is now focusing on the sustainability challenges around our manufacturing processes. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I've mentioned we want to get in front of that and join bodies like the Green Trade Association. Um, we, we are, we're seeing more and more now, spe you know, specifically since COVID-19, that there's a lot of funding from government around the green recovery, as they call it. So there's, there's now more potential 
for SMEs or small medium sized enterprises um, and larger companies to tap into that funding to position themselves not just from an economic perspective but innovate you know from a sustainability perspective as well so that's something that the UK government has put a lot of money into um, but I still think that we need to do more in that space um, and if we do that then I think we can start to get SMEs to not just think about the economic side but also the sustainable side and that's what I mean from it needs to be a top-down bottom-up approach you know it just can't be that we expect the industry to to go and do this off the run back. There needs to be the incentive there because at the end of the day, they need to make money. So, you know, I would say that that is critical um, when moving forward with this. Okay. Is there like uh, what I would like, uh, what I'm very interested in, I mean, we have two persons here more into research and consulting and we have two companies already producing. Is there kind of communication between these two areas? That means, uh, Stephen, if you hear a solution like uh, Molly Works or Dimension, uh, is, it, is it that you reach out to them and there's like meetings and uh, uh, you, you talk about that topic and how to integrate it in future manufacturing processes? Is there an exchange beside form next connect of course yes yeah, so i've actually just taken a note of felix and christopher's <laughs> details to, to actually you know communicate with them after this so you know definitely you know that's what we want to do we want to bring together and the, the Fraunhofer will be the same we want to bring together you know different areas of the supply chain um, to gain you know whatever benefit it may be um, and that requires both technology providers, um, small, small to medium-sized enterprises, tier ones and OEMs. And we do that through a number of different mechanisms, um, particularly with the large collaborative research and development projects, um, which helps um, the industry companies involved in that to you know, grow their business in a particular area that they want to focus on in a particular market sector. So you know, definitely, that, that's exactly what we are set up to do have a mid-TRL um, space where we can support that early TRL development through the industry. Great. Christian, what about you? I mean, uh, you hear the two solutions. I probably, uh, I guess you, you knew them already uh, because uh, you are very much into that, that uh, community. Uh, but is it like you invite uh, young innovators, startups to Fraunhofer and talk to them and see what kind of solution they developed? Yeah, absolutely. So I think development, research and development today is, 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 is not anymore something where you like, like, like hide in, in your lab and try to bring forward new solutions. Uh, this is about exchange. This is about integrating uh, new solutions uh, from uh, the, let's say, scientific world, from the uh, area of startups, from established companies and everything. And we are always trying to bring together those things. Uh, this is why we have established uh, different uh, also organizations where uh, we are like bringing together the, the end users, uh, the, the developers uh, in the industry and uh, in research. So I think this is one of the most important tasks for us as well to uh, use platforms like Formex, like Formex Connect, but, but, but also others uh, in order to bring together those things. And the research and the development projects that we do I would say 90% of them are being realized together with companies or with a consortium of different companies, with end users, um, with suppliers, with all the software aspects and all these things in order to bring things forward. Uh, this is, this is uh, what, what we consider as the best way to do this. Absolutely. Great. So, um AM um, naturally uh, pays tribute to sustainability, but th this is a current trend and, uh, in my opinion, boosted also by the current pandemic situation. Um, Felix, a question to you. Do you think after the pandemic uh, situation, I hope we will have an after after that situation, do you think sustainability trend will still be sustainable or not? Yeah. Definitely. I think um, this won't go away anymore. Um, that's clear, of course. Right now, everything is uh, uh, about the pandemic. But um, um, I mean, sustainability is not only a trend. Yeah, I mean, sooner or later, everyone has to deal with it. Um, unfortunately, in this specific um, case, uh, time is our uh, worst enemy, right? Um, but uh, I'm 100% sure 
that um, um, sustainability will be the key topic again after the pandemic. And I also think that um, the adoption of 3D printing can really be accelerated when we um, when we push more on the sustainability sustainability topic and the potential impact that 3D printing um, can have on that. Great. Um, Christopher, um, I mean, you are very much focused, I guess, on the current development in your company, but do you see other examples in the man market, especially in the US, where companies uh, with a sustainable approach are uh, similar successful as you are? I think resource efficiency always moves to the bottom line. So I think it's going to be a strategy that people implement uh, yeah, going forward. Um, I don't think it's a it's as much of a trend uh, as it, it is really just a strategy. So uh, we, we didn't decide to uh, be resource efficient for any other reason other than we thought it was going to be more cost effective. Hmm. I mean, that was the, the main reason uh, what, why to do it. Uh, simpler things uh, are usually more cost effective and more competitive. So it just happens that they also are uh, having positive impact on the environment as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Christian, we, we, we are always talking about, yeah, yeah we, are, we are talking about additive manufacturing. This is an additive manufacturing exhibition, okay? But this is a quite small community, and we, we talked about uh, reaching out uh, to inform the people outside. We, we discussed this in, in, in another panel already that um, the awareness increased for additive manufacturing, but how can we achieve people outside AM start thinking about AM as a boost for sustainability? Or is there already something going on beside politics? I think um, what we have to see is that there is a, a global trend towards digitalization all around manufacturing. And maybe this is some of the yeah, let's call it silver linings of uh, the pandemic as well, that there is now even more attention to the need for digitalization, and not only in, 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 in exhibitions and, uh, and office uh, uh, applications and things like these, but especially also all around the manufacturing world. And this is something which is strongly discussed. And what AM can deliver here is that it is the perfect example how kind of a fully digital manufacturing process where you have an extremely short way from the digital product representation and optimization to really making it, to really producing it. Um, this is something which uh, Additive can perfectly show and to perfectly serve as an example how things can be realized also in, let's call it conventional manufacturing technologies, because I think we all agree that we will not be able to print everything in the future. We will need uh, the classical manufacturing and we will have to combine everything and this is uh, an extremely important topic and I think that and, 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 and we see this in many examples more and more that additive manufacturing as I said is a perfect example how digitalization can be of extremely high benefit for manufacturing as a whole and maybe this is something we have to even more connect to each other uh, in order to make uh, AM more visible in the whole manufacturing community. Absolutely true. So there are a lot more questions of the audience, and if you don't mind, um, I will address some of them to you. Uh, here's a question. Um, can 3D printing using local biomaterials be used for producing houses as part of a closed-loop system with localized supply chain? Has there been much work in this area? So local biomaterials used for producing houses as a closed loop. Is, have anybody of you heard already about such a project or what is going on in this direction? Probably Christian or Steven. It's certainly not an area that, that we've been working in um, currently. You know, for construction, certainly, you know, we've got, we've got some interest around that area in additive manufacturing. I think that's that's probably a, a sector which which needs to be exploited further. Um, in terms of the, the biomaterials, it's not something that I'm familiar with. What to say? Okay, Christian. No, we don't have, we don't have any biomaterials, but uh, yeah, as as some uh, young homeowners in my company, there's a lot of uh, recycled titanium fixtures, doorknobs, handles, uh, things that seem to be appearing in in uh, people in my company's home. So I don't know if that uh, answers the question, but 
a bit. Uh, titanium yeah. uh, fixtures uh, seem to be ending up in people's homes. Okay. Yeah. Felix. I think that's an interesting yeah. topic. So maybe just to add one, yeah. one, one, one short Good. word on this. Uh, all the all the construction area, all the building area is something where 3D printing comes more and more, and there are many startups, many uh, activities in that area. Um, and for sure, the idea is also to come into kind of a circular economy, in, into into reusing things in in, in those fields. Uh, but uh, my feeling is that we are not yet at a point where this is really highly commercial. But there are interesting developments uh, going into this direction. Felix, there are two for you. Okay, so um, oh. yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry for that. Um, so the first one is: Are there already long-term research results about microplastic from dissolving AM getting into the environment, or is there no danger coming from the specially AM pre-modified plastics for the environment? I mean, you're dealing with plastics. Can you answer that question? Yeah, phew, that's uh, not uh, super easy to answer, right? Um, but I, I think basically when we talk about microplastics and um, the pollution um, of our oceans, I think the biggest issue is not plastics itself, right? It's the behavior of people. Um, and uh, because we can produce things super cheap with plastics, um, um, that doesn't mean that we are not responsible for our behavior, right? Um, so, and I mean, when you, when, you dis, when you think about 3D printing, I think at least what we can achieve is that we get rid at least a bit more um, um, and when we talk about the throwaway culture, right? Mm -hmm. So with 3D printing, we can produce products with, um, um, with higher value. Um, and if products have higher value, I think that's super necessary. Um, that that's super necessary when we when we discuss about things like um, uh, throw away, throw away culture, where you can buy f um, uh, sunglasses for three euro. So I think three uh, D printing in general um, can also have a, um, a positive impact there. But I'm not sure if I got the question right. Was it uh, also a technical question regarding the solvent that we are using for vapor polishing? No, no it's, it's, it's more a question of is there already um, a study or result on the impact of the plastics used in, in your production processes? Are there microplastic parts coming into the environment? Is there something already known in the AM field? So far, no studies, and so far, I don't know about that. Um, so hopefully, I'm right. Uh, but if someone knows uh, something that uh, where this could be, then of course, I'm super happy to discuss it. Uh, but so far, um, 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 we don't think so. Cool. Then we have a more, let's say, global question. I like that very much. Um, it's, it starts critical, but I think we can take that. The tipping point where sustainability becomes equally more important than the financial economic drivers, which we discussed extensively at the very beginning of our panel. Um, let me, sorry, where is it? It's gone. Um, so the question was, is there, um, I mean, if it's not driven the, t the topic by the industry, is there any governmental um, initiative that is pushing that? Or which are the states or the countries that are pushing it most? So probably Christian or Stephen. So... Stephen, please. So on you go, on you go, Christian. On you go. <laughs> um, so I think what we see for sure are activities like the Green New Deal of the of the European Union and uh, some activities around that, which are especially also focusing things like circular economy, and um, to uh, yeah, in a certain way, make sustainability an additional economic factor to be considered when you bring products to markets um, and things like these. So uh, this is one of the activities, but we see activities from other countries um, as well, which, which, which I'm maybe not the right person to, to, to really go uh, uh, extremely deep in those activities because I heard of them, but I, but I can't explain them, uh, them in detail. But I think um, that let's say, in the, in the uh, environment, in the, in the activities that we see from the political side, there is a way towards making activities for sustainability more important and making them kind of an economic factor. 
Um, and there is simply, uh, I'm, 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 I'm convinced of that, there is simply the need to have this as an additional factor, and I think it will not take long until uh, this also uh, becomes a known factor um, beside the cost or, or is going into the cost of products more and more um, and will be a decisive factor uh, in the future for those activities, absolutely. Great. Uh, Felix, uh, now here comes the second question. Uh, just missed the, the last time. Um, Fortunately, I'm not able to read them before. That would be great. Uh, no, but, no, no, uh, no. I'm looking forward to but the that's, next question. That's the adventure. <laughs> um, no, actually, there's, there's a person asking um, for um, initi uh, initiatives uh, dealing with recycling or 3D printing parts. Uh, the question is, uh, if you apply a coding in post-production, it's more difficult to recycle or, or Christopher can answer as well. So um, do you see beside your post-processing post -processing process which is already focusing by using um, a solvent that is uh, eco-friendly, let's put it that way, are there any initiatives where you see that um, they take care of coating is already environment friendly? beside your solution? So I mean, maybe I can start. I mean, basically we don't use coating. Yeah? We just use the solvent to dissolve the, the surface um, um, of the material and then we take the solvent out of the part again. So basically um, um, and there is no coating left or something. Not, not, um, not, not a dimension, the, that's uh, not what I meant. But, but if you take recycled parts that have been coated, is there already an initiative to recycle them anyway or to reuse them as, as powder or AM material? And is that possible? Recycling is a super complex topic, so maybe Christian uh, can elaborate oh, on Christian, that a bit yeah. better uh, than, than myself. I, I just know that recycling, especially with plastics, is uh, super complex and, and not so easy. Christian, any comment from I your side? I think that's, yeah, maybe just a short comment. So uh, maybe uh, one of the most important things about recycling plastics uh, in, into high-quality products, and this is what we are mostly talking about, is that you have... Um, a good knowledge about what kind of material is this. So if you have like kind of mixed plastics with coatings, with everything, then always those things become much more complicated to uh, get high quality products out of them. You can then make some, some kind of new pl plastic products, but, but only low quality um, uh, things. So maybe that's a chance of 3D printing as well, because um, we, we, we have the possibility to integrate um, uh, let's say, the knowledge about what kind of material is this uh, into the product design and then uh, having a, a way to really recycle things um, in, in kind of single material steps afterwards. Okay. Um, I, I think uh, on, on the... Pardon? Go ahead. I, I think on the metal side, if, if, if there are coatings uh, on them for, for our process, it's simple enough to just uh, grit, grit blast them away. Uh, what, what is most exciting uh, for, for me, actually, is using uh, materials such as titanium uh, that require uh, significantly less coating uh, and therefore at the product end of life uh, can be more directly recycled. Um, although they may be a, a little bit higher cost uh, up front, but they're going to have a longer uh, lifetime and they're more uh, easily uh, recyclable. So I think with uh, more thought uh, into what we're doing, not just today, but 30 years from now, um, we can actually solve these problems uh, a little bit more efficiently down the road. Great. Uh, Christopher, another one for you. Uh, how does the performance compare in using recycled sustainability materials over virgin? And are you at cost parity already? I mean, this is a question probably you get asked by a customer. Is the performance the same? Yeah, it's the, it's the highest barrier to entry uh, for the customer. So, I mean, it, it, the, the answer is, is you have to produce powder that meets their current specification or you don't get to play with any of the customers. There, there's not like a, a slightly worse powder that they'll pay for because it's sustainable. Um, so you always have to be producing powder to the, the standard specification. Um, so, yeah, we basically had to develop refining and, and atomization process to meet those specifications. Great. Steven, um, 
Are you already seeing, or what are, what are probably the solutions similar to Dimension and MoliWorks, what they presented, are you seeing already manufacturing processes that will pop up in the near future that get more attention due to sustainability? Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, you know, we're, we're working on a process just now internally um, where we're actually using revert powder from the additive process and and forging that together um, to create components. So, you know, there is secondary processes and um, innovations being created um, as a result of some of the maybe non-sustainable parts of the AM process and trying to, you know, utilise that material um, and bring it back into into use um, in a diff slightly different way from what, what Christopher's company is doing. So, you know, there, there's a lot of different innovations. Um, and I think, as I mentioned, you know, if we can support those innovations with, with funding and incentives, then more of these can grow and they can become more established within um, the AM sectors. Um, you know, I would also, I know we're just finishing up, but I guess some other areas we haven't touched upon was um, you know, Christian was talking about digitalization and, you know, the fact that we can, you know, create more localized production um, and reduce logistical costs is another big economic and sustainable um, benefit of additive manufacturing. Um, again, I'll revert back to the oil and gas sector, but, you know, for instance, it's a sector we work with quite closely um, and they hold significant amount of, of spare parts um, in stock because they just can't take the risk of um, anything going down. Um, and many of these spare parts can't actually be used at all. Um, and, you know, it locks in a considerable amount of, of value. So the, there's also a big warehousing cost that goes alongside that. So, you know, if we can, you know, look at additive and use it to manufacture locally, create local supply chains, save logistical costs, then, you know, that has a knock-on sustainability benefit um, from a, you know, it's transformational in terms of the procurement process and also the, the you know, the transportation, logistics and warehouse, warehousing um, that goes alongside that. Um, so that's, that's not just, you know, answering your question there, but it's something that I wanted to mention before the end of this um, seminar. Great, thank you. Uh, this leads uh, exactly to the next question, Stephen. Um, I will ask it to Christian, but uh, everybody is is uh, welcome to step in. Um, there is some we, we talked about end customers, okay? And th there's uh, probably one end customer that is asking um, uh, to save energy, get production close to the customer. That's a basic principle for sustainability. Are there any plans about empowering customers? I mean, we, we, we have seen all the do-it-yourself solution with 3D filament printers. But is there anything more to come where we get end customers in the position to print their own products? Beside this very early tries, Christian. Do you see any end customer 3D printing system coming up? Let's say I think we have to strongly differentiate between the, the kind of parts that have to be made. So um, definitely there are certain parts where this becomes more and more viable, but maybe it's not the, the, the final customer or consumer, but maybe it's kind of regional, really regional uh, hubs where things might be produced um, on, 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 on a little bit higher level, uh, making it possible. Because in terms of sustainability, you also have to consider the let's say um, yeah in the end it's kind of the the, the OEE of the uh, of the of the machines if you mm. uh, put like a, a, a really low cost machine to everybody that might be uh, sustainable for 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 the single part that you made make but if you only make like one part a week or one part a month uh, on this then the sustainability issue uh, also is, is is converted into kind of um, the other way around. So I think for extremely um, um, easy to print parts, that might be a, a good way. I more believe, I do more believe in kind of really regionalized um, uh, production hubs where certain products uh, might be realized um, on, 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 on a more industrial level because this gives you more control, not only about cost, but also about sustainability. 
True. But uh, this is a very important topic. Um, we, we were talking a lot about regional production, local production to save transportation costs, um, save uh, warehouses, etc. Um, and I hear that topic for quite a long time as an advantage of additive manufacturing. But is that already in place? Do we have examples where we see that? I remember, I remember once discussing uh, a shoe, shoe shop in the US where you can order your, your shoe and it's printed for you. Uh, I mean, this, the, those are nice stories. But do we have it already in place? Do we have existing systems where, where this is uh, being practiced? Stephen, probably. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, we need to be realistic. It's, you know, I think you're right. You know, for a number of years, people have been talking about, you know, on-demand printing. Um, you know, what I'm saying here is, is that, you know, logistically, you know, we'll take a large-scale forging, for instance, um, which would require significant amount of capital investment, um, or you wait for perhaps six months um, for a component to be delivered to you. Um, what you know you can do now is is have you know a welding system and a robot in your facility, for instance, and actually have that supply chain around about you. Um, so you know I think you're right. You know talking about you know having home printers and, and printing all your utensils and things like that. You know that's just not you know what we're talking about here. But we're talking about being realistic and creating um, local supplies and supply chains around about. Um, your products um, and not having to rely on traditional um, supply chains, which can have long lead times um, and can can be quite expensive as well. True. True. Yeah. So I, I I definitely think we have already um, those examples. Um, may it be spare parts, may it be automotive interior parts, eyewear frames, orthesis, prothesis in the medical sector. So I think there are already a lot of um, applications that show that it it's possible. Of course. Uh, we definitely need to, I mean, every application need to kind of transform a whole industry. So this won't go, uh, that, that, this won't be too fast, but maybe to come back to your, uh, to, to the, 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 the question before that, uh, it's kind of funny that every panel discussion ends up with the question, if there will be home 3D printers in the future. Um, I'm not an expert in that, but I think when we talk about sustainability, the the big impact that we can have is not um, um, that we have to deliver parts from local manufacturing hubs to to the houses, right? It's more that we don't have to produce products in China and then ship them around the world. I think there is the big impact. Um, and yeah, if there will be home beauty printers in every home, I, I don't think so. But of course, um, um, yeah, I'm open to that. Uh, but I don't think that it, uh, that this will happen. But in my opinion, it also has not. There is not a huge sustainable impact if this happens when we have local manufacturing hubs. Uh, so totally with you, Felix. And uh, this is again, I think, what Christian explained before. Uh, this was a question, and and I like this question. I know I, I hear it uh, often as well in panel discussions, uh, and uh, it's it's still interesting in my opinion. So. Um, Probably each of you one sentence. What are the current uh, barriers or obstacles in boosting a little bit more sustainability, and how are we going to overcome that? After you had this discussion, you heard a lot from each of you. Uh, Christian, probably you are in the in the down left, at least on on my view. Um, probably you would start. What are the current obstacles you see, and what needs to be done in one or two sentences, please? I think the, the, the main obstacles, uh, obstacles come out of the traditional structures in many uh, companies and about the um, non-visibility um, of, uh, let's say, sustainability in product and manufacturing processes. And we have to make those things more transparent and more visible because in many cases, the real cost of being more sustainable is even lower than uh, of uh, doing it the conventional way. Thank you so much. Stephen, what about you? Yeah, I'll, I'll just actually add to what Christian says there. I, I completely agree. Um, I think we need to be more transparent across the full manufacturing stages. Um, you know, it's the old saying, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Um, and if we can measure it, then we can create things like life cycle analysis models around these things and then start to improve 
or processes. So I think it's about transparency, you know, having a more collaborative supply chain and, you know, really trying to draw out what the the carbon emissions is of each of those manufacturing stages in order to measure it and improve it. I think that would be the key thing for me. Great. Thank you. Felix? Yeah, of course, I agree um, 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 what already um, has been mentioned. But I think still that the biggest challenge is um, the mindset of the people, right? Um, we need to have a change in the mindsets of the people. And I, I don't have an idea how we can really accelerate this. Um, as I just, as I already mentioned, yeah, sooner or later it will happen anyway. But I think what we can do is uh, try to do uh, good things in terms of sustainability and talk about it. That's what we can do. Great, Christopher. I, I second Felix, and in, in a lot of that is I think that the mindset around recyclability needs to change. Where recyclability shouldn't viewed as worse quality, and instead we should start thinking about uh, if we own our metal supply chain from cradle to grave, we can have superior traceability, superior control, and actually produce higher quality metals. Great. So all four of you, thank you so much. It was an amazing panel. Thank you for all the insights, for taking any question. I'm uh, very uh, happy with that. Um, thank you for, for joining us, for sharing with us. Um, wish you a good luck, a lot of success for your future. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here on the panel and enjoy the rest of the Form Next Connect. And we are going on with the program. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks,